fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. We're going to be talking to author John Cameron. Now, he wrote the book It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, The Serial Killer You've Never Heard Of. Now, what's really interesting about this is um, uh, he's written the book, and uh, the serial killer is a person that loves to set up people and watch them be convicted of a crime that he did. Um, so uh, we know of three that he's done and suspected of several others, and, and the suspicions are he's been doing this for well over 40 years and um, what the connection is is he likes to go watch the trial and uh, what is fascinating was that he was caught in um, episode six of the Netflix documentary making a murderer about Stephen Avery so it kind of fits what he does. Uh, is it possible that he set up Steve Avery and even the police? Because that's kind of his M.O. Very interesting. And, of course, it's blown up all over the country. And uh, so we're going to talk to him about the uh, facts in his book and his thoughts. Now joining us, John Cameron. Um, thank you for taking time to uh, talk to us today. Well, I appreciate you having me out on, Al. Um, this is a story I think that really needs to be told, and it seems like slowly but surely it's starting to come out. Yeah, yeah, pretty bizarre. Um, so, so let's let's start kind of let's go back a little bit. Let's start with you. Um, now, your book, um, it's me. Um, it's about Edward Wayne Edwards. So, um, maybe tell people a little bit about him, kind of um, uh, what you wrote about in your book. Yeah, certainly. I never thought I was going to write a book, but in 2010, I was working in Deer Lodge Prison, Montana, as a parole board analyst, and I was a retired police detective for 24 years prior to that. And in 2010, this serial killer named Edward Wayne Edwards got caught in Wisconsin um, for the first time for murder, and he was 76 years old and married and had five children and 11 grandchildren. And while I was working in Deer Lodge Prison, um, I was notified that Mr. Edwards had been in Great Falls, Montana in 1956. And uh, that's where I live, is Great Falls, Montana, and that's where I was a police officer. So I had a cold case of a couple parked on a lover's lane in 1956 that had been kidnapped um, and then executed. And it remained unsolved forever until Edward Edwards got caught in Wisconsin in 2010 and confessed to killing a couple on a lover's lane in a similar fashion. And so that began my investigation of Edward Wayne Edwards, and that started in June of 2010. And so um, how far did you go with that then? So like, he um, was he ever caught? and officially tried of any of those um, crimes? No, what happened with Mr. Edwards is at the age of 76, he finally gets identified as being a serial killer. His daughter actually turned him in after she was watching a cold case and remembered that when she was very young that her father took her to the scene of a double murder. Well, it turns out that that scene of the double murder was the Wisconsin 1980 double murder that he actually confessed to in 2010. And so now he, at the age of 76, he's identified as a serial killer, and they put out a memo to all agencies, and especially to agencies um, 
that were connected to a book that this man wrote. Edward Edwards wrote a book when he was 39 years old. It was an autobiography on his life. And he claimed that he was a reformed criminal and now that he was a happily married family man. But what it turned out is what he was, was a big con artist. And he used his family and his wife and his children as alibis as he traveled the country killing his entire life, basically. And he was married three times. And so when I was able to put him in Great Falls in 1956 at the time of our double murder, I just decided I was going to write him a letter and ask him if he would confess to that murder. And so we could at least tell the, the uh, relatives that he was in prison and that he was actually going to be executed. And so that's how this all began in June of 2010, was by me simply writing Mr. Edwards a letter asking him if he would confess to the Great Falls murder so we could just put it to rest. He was going to die anyway. And that began what ended up becoming a six-year-long investigation now of a serial killer that started killing when he was 12 years old in 1945 and never stopped until 2009. And his entire M.O. was to set other people up. And he did it in practically every part of the country every decade since 1945. So what, what was his first killing, do you think, when he was 12? And who was it? His first killing was on June 5, 1945, in Chicago. He broke into a woman's house who was about uh, 30 years old, uh, beat, her to fake, beat her to death in bed, um, drowned her in the tub, put tape on her body, um, and also wrote on the walls, please stop me, I can't control myself. I'm going to kill more. And he was a very young kid at that age. He, he had been severely abused in a Catholic orphanage and had escaped just prior to age 12 and basically came out as a sexually deviant sadomasochist. And he was killing his mother over and over again in his first few killings uh, because his mother had been shot in front of him when he was very young. And he was abused, and uh, he just took this really to the dark side by age 12. And so he actually... Um you were saying he actually wrote a book. Uh, wh what? Who would publish the book? Like, what kind of um, what kind of subject was he really trying to cover in the book? Well, it's an actually incredible read. It's uh, it's about a four hundred page hard covered book, and here's the title. I'll read it off to you. It says he was on the FBI's list of the ten most wanted criminals. He was a holdup man, a bank robber, a dangerous character. He spent 14 years in five jails. Now he is a writer, a respected citizen, and the head of a family of five. Metamorphosis of a Criminal, the true life story of Ed Edwards. And what he claimed this book was, was his metamorphosis from being a real bad apple to being a family man. And he published it in 1972 at the age of 39. And what the book ended up being was a puzzle of murder. And inside the book, he had put an entire chapter of Great Falls, Montana, uh, my hometown, where he killed a couple. And he actually detailed the killing of the couple in parables throughout the story. And that ended up being true of the whole book. He traveled the country after he wrote this book and killed everywhere that he spoke about being in this book and set people up. So the book was just one big murder game thrown in the face of society um, as a taunt to try to figure out how smart he was. And the reason he titled it Metamorphosis of a Criminal is all it really meant was Metamorphosis of a Serial Killer. He metamorphosed into the best killer ever. That was his goal. And his goal was to have the highest kill count of any serial killer and be the most evil serial killer there ever was. So did he take pride in uh, um, getting, not really getting caught, but letting people know what he was doing or when he set someone up and they got uh, convicted for the murder he did, did it, was he proud of that sort of thing? Was that kind of uh, something that made him happy? Yeah, that's entirely what the whole book was about, too. He called it crimes of recognition. And when I first got involved in this investigation and Mr. Edwards told me that he was into crime for recognition and he had mentioned it in his book that he was into crime for recognition, I never understood what he meant by that because 
what everybody thought was, if you're into crime for recognition and you're a killer, then why don't you stand up and admit that everything you did, you know, when he finally gets caught in 2010? But that's really not what he meant by crimes of recognition. What he loved to do was to kill somebody, set somebody else up, and then watch as every day he could sit at the coffee table with his wife and his kids around and read a story about one of his murders that somebody else was going down for it. And so he was able to set somebody up in 1946, and that man spent his entire life in prison until 2012 and died an innocent man in prison set up by Ed Edwards. So by age 13, he was so good at setting people up that that became his addiction the rest of his life because he just loved to sit back, attend the funerals of the victim, appear in documentaries about the murders. He was always standing in front of everybody under assumed identity and just gloating in what he had created. Well, how, how did that work for his family? But um, you said he was married three times and stuff, so he was always with a spouse, I would imagine. Uh, so how would that work for them? Did they not realize when he was moving and doing things and stuff happening, or was he apart from them? Well, when I first started the investigation in 2010, I maintained on the 1956 Great Falls murder. And in 1956, Ed Edwards was married to a woman named Jeanette, and she was 18 years old from Idaho Falls. He had actually kidnapped her in 1955, and took her all over the country while he killed, portraying himself as a doctor, a doctor of psychiatry, a police officer, and a preacher with a wife who was pregnant. She did never cross him. She dared never to cross him. I interviewed her in 2011. Nobody had ever interviewed her um, for the last 60 years. And she never told anybody what had happened during the eight-month travel she did with him, 1955 and 56, for fear that uh, he would kill her, because he ended up spending his entire life taunting her with letters and threats that if she ever told anybody, he'd kill her, or he'd kill their son. And uh, they had a son here uh, that was conceived in Great Falls. And uh, I recently got to meet that son. He's 59 years old now. And uh, he, all he knew about his father was that his mother said that he was a serial killer and that he was a horrible man and that she never wanted him to know anything about him. So he just recently learned about his father. So that kind of showed what Edward's M.O. was. Is at the very beginning of this investigation, his M.O. was to kidnap a girl, force her to basically travel the country with him, and be under his control, impregnate her, and be killing the entire time, portraying himself as a happily married family man. And that ended up proving true when he married again in 1968. Uh, he was married to his wife uh, for the last 44 years um, and had five children and 11 grandchildren and basically traveled the country. And he would kill in adjoining states as he hid them out in campgrounds. So... Did he have an, a selection or an M.O.? Usually serial killers have a form that they, you know, the same type of person. Um, so the girls and the people he was selecting to kill, were they all sort of the same same age, same hair color, same style? Well, it really depended on what murder he was going to create. He was a ritual killer, and he created ritual murders. And what I mean by that is all of his murders tie together in some element whether he's killed one, three, or six at a time, and he has done that. He stages his murders as rituals that are usually based against satanic religion and Catholicism. And uh, his victims are all ages, all types, all colors. Um, he shoots them, stabs them, burns them, strangles them, um, has cannibalized them. He never had... He wasn't like most serial killers with a sexual addiction. His addiction was to kill, and to kill in a manner that would set someone else up and create a crime of recognition that would live into history and would be talked about forever. And that's what his MO was. There is no profile for a serial killer like Edward Edwards. The FBI does not have one. Nobody actually realized that the man really existed. 
and he's haunted us his whole life with different identities. And uh, his MO was just to kill and set people up. So when you first wrote him that letter, uh, did he respond right away? And uh, d did you get to go actually meet him in person? No, when I wrote him the first letter in June, um, he didn't respond to that letter. So I wrote him another one in October, but I didn't write him again in October until a friend of mine uh, confronted Edwards also by letter. Edwards was a letter writer his whole life. What he would do is he would kill, and then he would send letters to, say, the police or the victim's family or the editors of newspapers. And the letters he sent would have stories and, and true information about the murder, and it would be kind of a taunt to authorities that, well, the real killer is the guy writing the letter. It's me. And we ended up solving a puzzle that Edwards had sent April 20th of 1970 in the Zodiac case. And it was a 13-character puzzle called the Zodiac Identity Cipher. And the name Edward Edwards was 13 characters. And what Edwards had done in the Zodiac Cipher case was he had taken his name and he had made symbols out of his uh, out of the letters in his name. And we cracked the cipher and we confronted Edwards. And he, he admitted that we were right on the cipher but we didn't know the whole story of what he had actually done. So very early on in the investigation, we knew that he had killed here in Great Falls in 1956. We knew that he had killed in 2009 in Wisconsin, admitting it. And we knew he was the Zodiac killer. And from there, it took on a life of its own. We started uh, writing letters back and forth, um, talking to him on the phone, and trying to follow basically his puzzle and that's what it ended up being is we were right on some of the murders but we had no idea the depth of what he had done and that's what he was leading us to and in the end that's what he always wanted was that before he died he'd know that somebody had put the pieces together and that it would be revealed and that that's how it played out the last six years and so where is he now he died on April 7th of 2011 in an Ohio jail. He had been captured in Wisconsin in 2009 for a double murder. He pled guilty to it and then realized he couldn't get his death penalty. And that's what he always wanted once caught, was he wanted to be executed. And so he called the Ohio press in 2010, and he confessed to another Lover's Lane murder in Ohio, hoping to get the death penalty. And then he found out that he couldn't get the death penalty for the one he confessed to because the Supreme Court had put it on hold that year. So then he was forced to confess to one more murder in order to get his execution. And that was the murder of a 25-year-old man in Ohio who he had befriended, adopted, changed his name, insured him for $250,000, then kidnapped him, beheaded him, held his body for six months, and then planted his body on Christmas in a cemetery to collect the $250,000. And uh, eventually he didn't get caught on that murder for 13 years, and he collected $250,000 in 1997 on that murder. And with that money, he traveled the country killing people and setting people up, and he did it until 2009. Is there anybody popular that he sort of set up or famous? Practically everybody. You know, he, he, he did it from 1945 until uh, 2009. But probably the most well-known setup he did that most people know that have studied history of the United States was the setup of Dr. Sam Shepard in 1954 in Cleveland, Ohio. And he was a doctor in Cleveland, Ohio in 1954. And on the 4th of July, Somebody entered his house while he and his wife were sleeping, beat his wife to death, beat him, and in the end, the police felt that he was the killer. And so they arrested Dr. Sam Shepard in 1954. They were going to execute him, and then the death penalty was put on hold. And then in 1966, F. Lee Bailey represented Dr. Sam Shepard and got him out of jail and proved that he did not do it. They never knew who set up 
Dr. Sam Shepard, but it was Ed Edwards. And after Dr. Sam Shepard was released in 1966, Edwards was released the following year and came out and did the Zodiac killing. Now, in the Zodiac killing part, do you think he did all of the all of the killings or just one? No, there were actually five Zodiac killings. There were a couple on a lover's lane, December 20th, 1968. A couple on a lover's lane, July 4th, 1969. A couple on a beach in Berryessa, 1969. And then he terrorized a woman in a car in 1970 and her baby. There was a case in 1966 that a lot of people have claimed to be the Zodiac Killer, and I think the name of that was Sherry Jo Bates' case, 1966, in Riverside. But that was not a Zodiac case. Edwards was in prison until uh, September of 1967, and uh, he came out and immediately started killing and creating crimes of recognition all over the country. He had them going on in Michigan and California, Oklahoma, um, and Oregon. I think he had a particular reason why he would select and and start to do the killing or try to, you know, um, create something like, let's say, the Zodiac or uh, the Dr. Sam Shepard or anything like that. Is there, is there something that made him select, do you think? Yeah, everything was always planned. He didn't just randomly select his victims. What he would do, let's say, in a case of he's going to set up a husband for killing his wife, he would groom his way into the life of the family under disguise, being the nicest guy in the world. He was a very charming man and uh, was able to get into anybody. And so then he would pick the husband that's cheating on the wife, kill his wife, and as soon as the press got a hold of the fact that the husband was cheating, it didn't really matter if he did it or not. Everybody hated him, and he got convicted. And that is how it worked in every one of his cases. If it wasn't a wife cheater or a husband cheater or a kid that was maybe running away from home and uh, not respecting his parents, he tried to pick people that would violate the seven deadly sins so they would be sinners and then he would punish them by either killing them or killing someone close to them and setting them up. And so he was a ritual killer. It was all based on the occult. He was completely destroyed as a young boy in the Catholic Church by priests and nuns and older boys, raped, beat, uh, abused, and basically came out and decided he was going to be the most charming person ever and kill your closest friend. And that's really the portrayal of Satan. And so he picked people that would fudge, people that would sin, and set them up or kill their close ones. Uh, you were just in uh, Wisconsin. And uh, I guess you were um, speaking to uh, the uh, Steve Avery parents. Yeah, I've never even heard of Steve Avery until three weeks ago. And I published my book two years ago, actually, tomorrow. And uh, since the publication of my book, I've been really busy investigating other murders that Edwards had done all over the country and set people up. And I've been working with people that are in prison to try to get them out. But... Recently, somebody contacted me and said, you need to see the Steve Avery documentary by Netflix called Making of a Murderer. And so I turned it on um, somewhere right around Christmas Eve. And by the fourth episode, I couldn't believe what I was watching. Because that, that uh, documentary basically shows what Ed Edwards was capable of doing behind the scenes when he set people up on all of his setups and how officials acted and how it just created hatred among everybody. Um, the Steve Avery case, most people are just starting to hear about it, but he was set up for murder on Halloween of 2005 after he had spent 18 years in prison uh, on an assault that he didn't do. And so just prior to Edwards setting up Stephen Avery, Stephen Avery was all over the press and they were making laws in his name in Wisconsin, and he was famous because he had spent 18 years in prison. He was innocent. They were making a law in his name, and Edwards decided to steal his recognition and set him up for murder. And, uh, and it was only because of Steve Avery's name, and that is Avery, um, which is part of the Zodiac case. Steve Avery owned Avery Salvage, 
and lived on Avery Road and was the longest serving convicted man in the public in 2003, 4, and 5. And that's when Edwards decided to target him and set not only him up, but set the police up. Yeah, that's quite the uh, program. I've, I've watched them, and I've interviewed uh, Michael Griesbach, who's the uh, written uh, Innocent Killer. Where where was he when he was uh, in the documentary? Where did you where did you find him? Well, whether or not that's Ed Edwards in the documentary, there is an episode six in the Netflix Making a Murderer, and at uh, twelve minutes and thirty three seconds into the video, there is a shot of a man in a blue sweater standing by the door behind the prosecutor, and it lasts about five seconds. And that is the first shot that caught my attention, that possibly that could be Ed Edwards. Edwards loved to kill somebody, set someone up, and then attend the trial or attend the funeral, especially if there were cameras. If he could get himself photographed without anybody knowing the real killer was there, he would do it. And so in the making of a murderer shot in episode six, it's just a very strange shot, and it fits every aspect of Ed Edwards. I went out to Manitowoc last week and visited with the Avery family and tried to visit with the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office and been trying to identify that man in the video to see if anybody knew him that attended the trial. I haven't been able to find anybody yet. How, what was the reaction when you went there? Like How, how, how did the uh, Sheriff's Office um, respond to you? Well, that was interesting. I thought for sure if I, I tried to call for a week straight after I watched the documentary and realized that Ed Edwards was the culprit. Um, I called and left messages, but nobody would return my call. So I really just hopped in my car and drove 1,400 miles to Wisconsin and showed up at the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office last Tuesday and tried to speak to somebody. They wouldn't accept my book. They wouldn't accept my information, and they didn't want to hear it. Um, that's how it, that's how it went. But that's how this has always gone regarding Ed Edwards, because Ed Edwards was an informant his whole life. He knew police officers everywhere. He was friends with police officers everywhere. And uh, once he got identified in 2010 as a serial killer, there were police officers everywhere that recognized him and went, "Oh, geez, it's him." And that's who he was. He was that man that knew them all but they didn't know he was a serial killer. And so, and how were the uh, Avery family with you? They were awesome. I, I pulled into the salvage yard and I spoke with Dolores and Alan and uh, Charles and Earl and Brenda. Um, I sat inside the salvage office there. You know, the prosecutor in the uh, making of a murderer kept saying, how could somebody get Stephen Avery's DNA and plant it? That salvage yard office had more DNA of the Avery's in it, it would be easy to get anybody's DNA out the Avery family. You know, it's a salvage yard. You yeah. cut your fingers daily. Your hands are completely dirty. You've got rags laying around that your bloody hands are on. That's how Edwards got the DNA of Steve Avery. It was as simple as grooming his way into the salvage yard. At the time, he was 73 years old. He would be just and almost the same age as Steve Avery's parents. He would have been harmless. They wouldn't even have known what he was up to. And uh, just to get a little bit of blood and the sweat DNA is as simple as a T-shirt of Steve Avery's that he wore, and you got your DNA to plant. And so the prosecutors made it sound like it would be impossible to do because nobody wanted to believe that somebody would do this. But that's exactly what Edwards did his whole life is what happened in that documentary. Yeah. How do you think that he did it? Do you have a scenario? Yeah, it was Stephen Avery was released 9-11 of 2003. And uh, that's a very important time because just shortly after Steve Avery was released from prison after serving 18 years, the police arrested him, two innocent men, for one of Edwards' Halloween murders, 2001, in Columbia, Missouri. On Halloween in 2001, uh, Edwards killed an editor of a major newspaper in the parking lot. And then two years later, two innocent men, Ryan Ferguson and Charles Erickson, went down for the murder. 
and Charles Erickson confessed just like Brandon Dassey did, and it was a false confession. But all this occurred just after Steve Avery was released from prison. And then another Halloween murder of Ed Edwards uh, ended up in a wrongful conviction, and that was the 1975 murder of Martha Moxley. And in 2003, right around the time Steve Avery was released, Michael Skakel lost all of his appeals. He was arrested and was spending his life in prison for that murder. He's since been released. Ryan Ferguson has since been released. Both these Halloween murders were committed by Ed Edwards. And as soon as Steve Avery was released, all these Halloween murders were in the press, and that's when he decided to target Steve Avery for setup. So it was as simple as grooming his way into the life of Steve Avery and finding a woman that would be coming to that salvage lot on a regular basis that he could kill and then set Steve up for. And that woman happened to be Teresa Halbach, who would go there on a regular basis and photograph for Auto Trader magazine. And so she became the victim. She was the right age, 25. She was attending St. John's uh, Parish in St. John's, Wisconsin. Everything matched with the Catholicism that Edwards liked to target to kill and then killing her on Halloween night and uh, she was not burned in that fire pit Ed Edwards had blown bodies to parts and burned bodies to bits his entire life and always had a pre-planned disposal site and then would plant the bodies at a later date to whoever he wanted to lead it to Was there a significance to Halloween like to that date um, that he would be doing the murders on for? Well, the significance to his occult thinking is Halloween is the dark side, and the day that follows Halloween in Catholicism is All Saints Day, and the day that follows All Saints Day is All Souls Day. And so those were the three days that Teresa Hallback went missing and was reported missing on All Souls Day. And that's just tying it to his satanic occult nature. He's killing on the dark side on Halloween, which goes into the light side all saints day. That's the only reason he killed on those days. It was all ritual. But he also killed on Christmas, Easter, Fourth of July, Memorial Day, Columbus Day, uh, Palm Sunday, Good Friday. It was always tied into a day that would create more recognition. If you have a murder that happens on Christmas, it's going to get more press than it's going to get on, on, you know, June 2nd. That's his thought process. That's how deep he thought. So do you think, like, he had a, some sort of religious ritual behind it? So you think he was sort of following some sort of, like, like you were saying, satanic or something? Yes, yes. And it was all mathematical, actually, but based on a lot of the Catholic rituals. Uh, when he killed three boys at a time, and he did this several times, it was like he was the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He would uh, he would beat them like Jesus was beaten as he was headed to the cross. He would crucify. Um, he was just a very horrible Satanist, member of a secret society. And, and the reason they call it secret society is because they don't have to even talk about it. They... They know what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And then they're going to stand in front of you and be the nicest person in the world, and you're not going to know that the Satan is the one standing in front of you. That really was his thought process, was to be Satan and then be the preacher on the other side and be consoling the victims, and the victims didn't know that it was actually the killer consoling them. Wow. So he, he was really kind of messed up. <laughs> Possessed is more like it, you know. That's what a lot of people have said. Is you know, is that you believe in possession? You know, I I don't know, I don't know anymore. But I do know one thing: that this man, who had no conscience, was able to pull this off for 66 years and stand in front of us all. And in the end, it's almost like it's too obvious that we should have all seen it. But the problem being was. Nobody really listened to what he was saying. Uh, he was always standing in front of you, and nobody thought that somebody would write a 400-page book, walk up to a policeman, hand it to him, and say, hey, I hope this helps you in your work. And then that book 
was actually the answer to all the murders that he had done. That's how in, in your face he was. So what do you think, how did he get a hold of the, the girl, Teresa Halbach, and and what what do you so do you think he got her and shot her somehow and then brought her back and uh, st stuck her like did he burn her somewhere and then stick her body on the property like the, the remains like wh how do you see that happening? Well, first of all, the, the the murder had to happen on Halloween, so it was pre-planned to happen on Halloween. So that maroon van that Teresa was going to photograph somehow Edwards got wind that she was going to be there on that day, or he implied it into somebody's mind that that would be a good day to have her come out and take this picture. Somehow, she was designed to go there that day and was designed to be seen by Steve Avery last because that's the only way it would work. If Steve Avery was the last person that she was seen with alive, then he becomes a suspect. So it was simple as he knew she was going there to photograph at 2.30. That was the time she showed up. That area is so rural. I just drove there. It's at least a quarter mile from the main highway into the salvage yard. And then the salvage yard itself is 44 acres, so it's massive area, very rural. All Edwards would have had to do was be on the side of the road, just down the road off the entrance to the salvage yard, at the old man needing help. That's it. What the ruse was, we will never know. But it would be as simple as just an old man flagging you down and say, hey, I need help. Teresa was shot in the left temple, and she was also shot in the back of the head. Well, she was the driver, then that's exactly how he would have done it. He would have walked up to the driver's window with a 22, popped one in the head, and a 22 does not go through for the most part. It goes into the brain and zips around and kills you instantly. Doesn't bleed much. Push her in and drive away. She wasn't reported missing for three days, so she had three, he had three days with that vehicle and her, and nobody even knew she was gone. And then on the fourth day, the Avery family went to their cabin. They left town and went to the cabin. The only one there was Earl, and that's the day that he plants the car, the bones in the fire pit, the bones in the barrel, the cell phone in the barrel. Everything he planted there, Edwards had done exactly like that in 1955 before he came to Great Falls and killed here. He had done a murder exactly like Teresa Hallback in California in 1955. So that's how it went down. It was that simple. Um, he knew that Steve, that Steve Avery would be having a big bonfire because it was Halloween night. It's just what they did, sit around, drink beer, and have a bonfire. Um, that body was blown to bits by a bomb, and Edwards detailed how he makes his bombs. Basically, he takes a body... He goes into the forest with the body where he finds a log on the ground that's a dense log, digs a hole under the log, fills it with gravel, fills it with ammonia nitrate, fills it with coal and fluid, puts the body on top between the log and the hole, and sets it off. It blows the body to bits, and that's what he did to a body in 1960 in Portland, Oregon. And then he just collected the remains, and he threw it in the fire pit. And... Uh, that Terry Halbach's remains fit in a very small box. That's all that was left. They were sharded. She was blown to bits by Edwards' bomb, which he actually described in the Zodiac case, making he details it in the Zodiac letter how to make it. So he must have had access. Do you think it would have been easy for um, him to get, because they're saying that she was shot in the head, but with a gun from Steve Avery's, uh, what was hanging over his bed. Yeah, that whole gun uh, issue is kind of interesting because they didn't find the slug until March of 2006. Yeah. And, you know, and so right there tells you what happened there. Did, you know, did he shoot him with Steve Avery's gun? Because the slug would have been inside Teresa Hallback. It would have been inside of her head. And Edwards would have collected it. And Edwards was a civil, and a civil patrol expert. He groomed his way into uh, searches for his own victims. And in the case of Teresa Halbach on the day of the 5th, the people that searched for Teresa Halbach's car and walked directly to it were part of just a volunteer search group at St. John's Church, over 100 people. 
And that's what Edwards would have groomed his way into. And he steered them to go right to the car as they went to go search, and they found it just like that. And uh, the lady that actually found the car said that God led her to the car. Yeah. And she had a, she, she had attended the church just before finding it, and I'm sure God did lead her to the car, but it wasn't God. Yeah. It was Ed Edwards. And it was as simple as suggestion. You know, you're sitting around in a group in the church, you've got your friend missing, you're going to go search, and you go directly to Avery Salvage on your own, find the car in 10 minutes, and boom, you have a crime of recognition. So they were all led there, and then the police show up. See, how, And, of course, the police don't want to hear any of that because they, they, they want it to be done with. Well, you know, it's a shame that the police don't want to hear it now because, in a way, uh, Ed Edwards actually gives them kind of a break. They come across really bad in that documentary, and they did some things that are horrible. The, the confession of Brandon Daffy is, is horrible and should have never been taken. It was clear that it was forged and that it wasn't proper. But the planting of the uh, keys in the house later on and the blood in the car and the, and the DNA on the hood latch, that was all done by a serial killer that was designing it to make the cops look like they were doing it because the cops were all over the press, too, just before the murder. They were all being deposed because they were. some of them were lying. Some of them were doing things that weren't very good, and they were about to pay out $36 million to Stephen Avery. And so part of the plan was just not to set Steve Avery up, but to set the cops up, too. And that's what he did in all of his cases. It was always about making the cops look like fools. Just, just crazy. Uh, did, did you talk to the family, uh, the Avery family, about kind of your your thought on the on the killing, um, about Edward Wayne Edwards, and and did they respond to that? Yeah, I did. And actually, it was a great talk. And then the next day, they they got a call from Kathleen Zellner. Um, the famous attorney out of Chicago who's now going to represent Steve Avery. And uh, Kathleen Zellner is in my book on page 392 because she represented Ryan Ferguson and Charles, and Charles Erickson. She didn't represent Charles Erickson. She represented Ryan Ferguson, excuse me, and got him out on one of Edwards' murders on Halloween. So it was really good to see that Kathleen Zellner hopped in uh, the day after I left because I really think they're going to take it and run with it, and uh, and we'll get them out. Do you, do you really think that'll happen, or do you think that uh, he he's it's really he's really up against a wall this time? Yeah, that, they all are. You know what's amazing about Steve Avery is he is just one of over a dozen men sitting in prison right now on Ed Edwards' murders that are in the exact same position. They're just not getting all the recognition like Steve Avery is right now, but. Um, I think it's changed. The, the uh, Netflix documentary, Making of a Murderer, has exposed what really goes on behind the scenes in the justice system. And it was a great thing to finally see because it was almost like six years of my work and putting out a book, and then all of a sudden there it all is in a documentary in real life. I couldn't believe what I was watching. That is what happens behind the system. It becomes a system of ego against ego, lawyer against lawyer, instead of truth. And that's what happened to Brandon Dassey and Steve Avery. They got caught in the middle of some ego fighting and a horrible serial killer that nobody wanted to acknowledge existed. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate. What do you, what do you think? Um, so you watched the uh, series, of course, on Netflix. Um, do you think they did a pretty good job? You know, I've heard a lot of comments that it was slanted towards the, towards the defense. But, you know, the defense is the only one that allowed cameras. The prosecution didn't. So it would be slightly planted. But there was nothing in there that I saw that planted it towards the defense. I felt that the way the police and the prosecutors produced this case, they should have just stopped and said something isn't right. They all knew that something wasn't right. It doesn't make sense that you're going to kill a woman and then bury her body next to your bedroom window and hide her phone in a barrel next to a car, you know, and, you know, do all this stuff to try to kill somebody and get away with it, and then plan all the evidence to lead to you. That just doesn't happen. What happens is it was planted. The problem the police have is they were the ones that were being accused of being the planted, 
they were the ones doing all this stuff, but they weren't. But the killer was inside them. He would have known somebody inside Manitowoc County. Probably not as Ed Edwards, probably as Wayne. But uh, somebody in Manitowoc uh, knew Wayne Edwards. Yeah, and the, and the police should have never had the uh, Manitowoc County um, doing the investigation because you can't have the same people you're deposing um, for a wrongful trial before um, investigating them now. No, that's law enforcement 101. When I was a police sergeant here in Great Falls, it's our sheriff's office got in some trouble, and we were stepped in. They stayed out of it. That's what you do, or the state would come in. We stayed out of it. Um, what went on there was classically what goes on in an Ed Edwards setup murder because he's always in the background stirring the evidence to lead you to a little more evidence, to a little more evidence. And that's kind of how it played out with Steve Avery. You know, four months into after they arrested him, they don't really have a case against him because it doesn't make any sense. There's no blood in his bedroom. It just doesn't make sense. And then they get Brendan Dassey to confess to killing her by rope, by knife, by gun, and by fire. Yeah. And that's what Ed Edwards does. And uh, I would bet that there's an anonymous letter that arrived at the sheriff's office sometime between... Halloween of 2005 and the time Brandon Dassey confessed that was written by Ed Edwards that's going to be anonymous and is going to describe exactly how she was killed, tied to the bed, stabbed, burned, and it's just going to be a big parable from the serial killer himself. That's what he did in all of his killing. Yeah, yeah, it was just crazy, though, everything from the beginning to the end. Why do you think people are so outraged by it now? Just because of uh, they didn't realize what went on in... In the, in the justice system? or Yeah, that's exactly what I'm hearing. Um, you know, I've been, I've been saying this for six years, ever since I started this thing with Ed Edwards and wrote this book, that, that wrongful convictions happen a lot and the system isn't quite as good as we all think. And then to see it play out in ten episodes, most people that I've uh, spoke to can't even stop watching it. They turn it on at night and they just watch it until they hit the tenth episode because it was that uh, revealing and maddening. That's what they say. They're furious that that's what our officials that we're paying money to do the right thing are doing. And uh, we've gone backwards. Yeah, it was certainly human flawed and and it was um, you know, you're right. Uh, Dassey should have never been convicted on that kind of a confession that was just coerced and a low IQ he wasn't a very smart boy you know when I was a police officer I got a confession in 1992 from a man who was 30 years old who had a low IQ and I knew he didn't commit the murder but he confessed to the murder and I could have easily just kind of said well I'm taking you down but but it was clearly it's easy to manipulate people in an interview especially if you're a police officer and you have your uh, subject in a room where he's not free to go, and uh, it's very easy to do. And if you cross the line and you don't keep your mind open to what the evidence is, uh, then you end up convicting innocent people. And you can see throughout Brendan Dassey's interview that he is so confused and everything that they're saying is just being put right into his head. And uh, he just agrees with them because they're the, they're the authority. Yeah. Yeah, well, he was scared, and he didn't know what to say. He didn't know the meaning of half the words. Um, oh, it was just silly. And then, then his defender didn't defend him, sent, sent him in. The investigators just were trying to get a confession. Um, it was wrong. I would say that when I, when I watched the part where uh, Brandon Daffy confesses to his own investigator, to his defense investigator, I couldn't believe what I was watching because that man is supposed to represent Brendan Daffy. And he was in Brendan's face more than the police were, demanding that he just confess and write it down and show. And he just he just forced him to do it. It was his own investigator and his own attorney. That alone should dismiss that case. That kid should have been out years ago. Um, it's disgusting. People are just lost fast. Just watch that. Yeah, and I'm afraid <laughs> it, you know it's just it's almost too late in the sense that you know his life is is not going to be the same. It's ruined um, 
you know, he spent how many years now? Six, seven years now already in prison. Um, I, I, it's just terrible what what's happened to that family. Uh, well, they feel helpless. And Stephen's being held in uh, Waupon, Wisconsin. And before I even heard of Stephen Avery, I was in Waupon in uh, July interviewing another man that Edwards set up named Christopher Coleman. And he was convicted in uh, 2009 of killing his wife and two kids in bed while they slept. And uh, Edwards just targeted him to set up because he could, and he was cheating on his wife. And he got convicted. He's doing 300 years now. And we now know that it was Ed Edwards that committed that murder. And he's sitting in there as frustrated as could be because uh, there's nothing you can do once you've gone through all your appeals and you have nobody to, to help you. The system will not help you. The system feels that if the jury convicted him, then the jury was right. Well, if the jury wasn't given all the facts, then the jury wasn't right. But uh, they don't look at it that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that kind of shows that if people watch that um, make, him the mur make him murderer, because, uh, it, yeah, and I think that's probably what upsets people. So, so where do you see yourself um, going now? Like, what's your plans um, for the uh, future here? Well, you know, this whole thing has just been one uh, roller coaster ride after the other. I kind of thought I had reached the climax of it when I found the May 5th, 9th, uh, 2009 triple murder in Columbia, Illinois, where Christopher Coleman went down for that murder. I thought, you know, well, that's kind of the crescendo. I didn't have that murder in my book, and after I published the book, that murder came forward, and that was another Ed Edwards murder, and it was last murder before he got caught. And uh, then all of a sudden, the Steve Avery case comes along. So my, my guess is this is never going to end because we know how many Ed Edwards killed between 1945 and 1996. And he announced his count, and that count was 500 people. And that 500 people not only includes the people he killed, but also includes the people he set up and the system killed. But he was free until 2009, 13 more years. So if you went on his averages, he killed 630 people, and out of the percentages, one quarter usually went down in a wrongful conviction or the person that was accused killed themselves or was driven to death by the killer himself. So I was able to find, I think I'm probably around three dozen to 50 uh, wrongful convictions. Out of those, I, I could name seven of them that are in right now that, uh, that are spending their life in prison that I've spoke to. Um, it's horrible. He, he killed every waking moment of his life. Even uh, if he could walk into a church with his family and walk out and kill somebody and then hop in the car and drive away with his family, he would. Um, it was all about creating terror. Hmm. So obviously he was like sociopath. He had no feelings toward killing people, obviously. You know, he produced a uh, religious motivational album in 1970. <laughs> um, yeah, he was 37 years old, and you can listen to it on my website, coldcasecameron.com. It's right on the home page. It's incredible. It's 30 minutes of a serial killer telling you how he groomed his way into religious organization and killed and uh, it's interesting to hear his voice because you get to hear the Zodiac Killer's voice in the year that he announced himself. And uh, he put this stuff out there because he was the Zodiac, and he always wanted to be caught, but he wanted to be identified. It was always about his identity, and that's because he, his real name isn't Edward Edwards. His real name is Charles Edward Meyer, and at age five... His mother was shot in front of him, and his name was changed to Edward Edwards, and he was put in a Catholic orphanage, raped, beaten, and abused, and became a monster. And so then he teased everybody for six decades with his identity. Who am I? And that's why he wrote the identity cipher in the Zodiac cases. He said, if you, uh, if you crack this cipher, you're going to know who I am. And, and we did in 2010, and when we confronted him, he confirmed it in a letter that started out, it's me. And so it was just 
an incredible ride investigating Ed Edwards, and it's not going to end. I'm going to be doing this until my death, I suppose, but it's been enjoyable. I've been able to do it for six years now and make a living at it and have fun at it. Wow. Well, um, what's, what's your contact information for people if they, if, if they want to get in contact with you or send you maybe some, some leads or information? Yeah, I have a website, coldcasecameron.com. That website contains the entire timeline of Ed Edwards' life, all of his killings and all of his setups and all of the documents. It's uh, very lengthy. You can get a hold of me through there. You can get a hold of me on Facebook through Cold Case Cameron at Facebook or at John Cameron here in Great Falls, Montana. And all my contact information is on my website. And my book is called It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, The Serial Killer You Never Heard Of. And it's on Amazon and uh, also on my website. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for taking some time. I, I'm sure you're busy with lots of uh, calls now. Yeah, it has been really busy. It's been kind of fun to see things uh, kind of get excited. Uh, the Avery case just really threw me for a loop. It's almost as if it was just... Uh, it's all about timing. Um, my daughter told me it would be six years before this thing was revealed, and she was right. 2016, I think, is the year that it will be revealed of what Edwards did, and uh, hopefully we'll get a lot of these innocent people out of prison. Yeah, it's a good thing. Well, thanks it is very a good much. Thing. Yeah. Well, I thank you for having me on, Al. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you!